Today's story is about a professor, yes, the professor of criminal world, Charles Sobraj. Sobraj was born as Hachand Banani Guryumak Charles Sobraj to Vietnamese shop girl Tran Lo Phan, and Indian Sindhi businessman Sobraj Hachit Bhavani, who was based in Saigon. His parents were unmarried and his father later deserted the family. Stateless at first, Sobraj was adopted by his mother's new boyfriend, a French army lieutenant stationed in French Indochina. However, he was neglected in favor of the couple's later children. Sobraj continued to move back and forth between France and Indochina with the family. As a teenager, he began to commit petty crimes and received his first jail sentence for burglary in 1963. Serving at Poissy Prison near Paris, Sobraj manipulated prison officials into granting him special favors, such as being allowed to keep books in his cell. Around the same time, he met and endeared himself to Felix Discogne, a wealthy young man and prison volunteer. From here Sobraj managed to get released on parole. After being paroled, Sobraj moved in with Discogne and shared his time between moving in the high society of Paris and the criminal underworld. He began accumulating riches through a series of scams and burglaries. During this time, he met and began a relationship with Chantal Camponen, a young Parisian woman from a conservative family. Sobraj proposed marriage to Camponen, but was arrested the same day for evading police while driving a stolen car. He was sentenced to eight months in prison. Chantal remained supportive during his prison time. Sobraj and Chantal were married upon his release. Sobraj and Chantal who was pregnant left France in 1970 for Asia to escape arrest. After traveling through Eastern Europe with fake documents, robbing tourists whom they befriended along the way, the Sobraz arrived in Mumbai in 1970. Here, Chantal gave birth to a baby girl, you sure? In the meantime, Sobraj resumed his criminal lifestyle, running a car theft and smuggling operation. Sobraj's profits were used towards his growing gambling addiction. In 1973, Sobraj was arrested and imprisoned after an unsuccessful armed robbery attempt on a jewelry store at Hotel Ashoka. Sobraj was able to escape, with Chantal's help, due to faking illness, but they were recaptured shortly thereafter. Sobraj borrowed money for bail from his father and soon after fled to Kabul. In Kabul, the couple continued robbing tourists on their hippie trail, only to be arrested once again. And again, Sobraj escaped in the same way he had in India, feigning illness and drugging the hospital guard. This time, Sobraj fled to Iran, leaving his family behind. Chantal, although still loyal to Sobraj, but wishing to leave their criminal past behind, returned to France and vowed never to see him again. Sobraj spent the next two years on the run, using as many as ten stolen passports. He passed through various countries in Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. Sobraj was joined by his younger brother, André, in Istanbul. Sobraj and André quickly became partners in crime participating in various criminal activities in both Turkey and Greece. The duo were eventually arrested in Athens. After an identity switch plan went awry, he escaped, but his brother was left behind. André was turned over to the Turkish police by Greek authorities, and served an 18 years sentence. On the run again, Sobraj financed his lifestyle by posing as either a gem salesman or drug dealer to impress and befriend tourists, whom he then defrauded. In Thailand, Sobraj met Marie Andre Leclerc, from Levi's, Quebec, a tourist looking for adventure. Dominated by Sobraj, she quickly became his most devoted follower, turning a blind eye to his crimes and his philandering with local women. Charles Sobraj gathered followers by gaining their loyalty. A typical scam was to help his target out of difficult situations. In one case, he helped to form a French policeman, Yannick and Jacques. 
They sought Sobraj's help to recover their missing passports. Sobraj had actually stolen the passports. In another scheme, Sobraj provided shelter to a Frenchman, Dominique Renel, who appeared to be suffering from dysentery. Sobraj had actually poisoned Renel. He was finally joined by a young Indian, Ajay Choudhury, a fellow criminal who became Sobraj's second in command. Sobraj and Choudhury committed their first, known murders in 1975. Most of the victims had spent some time with the duo before their deaths and were, according to investigators, recruited by Sobraj and Choudhury to join the pair in their crimes. Investigators state that the victims had threatened to expose Sobraj, which was his motive for murder. The first victim was a young woman from Seattle. Teresa Knowlton, named Jenny Bolivar in the book Serpentine, was found drowned in a tidal pool in the Gulf of Thailand. She was wearing a flowered bikini. It was only months later that Knowlton's autopsy, as well as forensic evidence, proved that her drowning, originally believed to be a swimming accident, was a well-planned murder. The next victim was a young nomadic Sephardic Jew, Vitaly Hakim, whose burnt body was found on the road to the Pattaya Resort, where Sobraj and his growing clan were staying. Dutch students Henk Bintanja, 29 years old, and his fiancée Cornelia Hemke, 25 years old, were invited to Thailand after meeting Sobraj in Hong Kong. They, like so many others, were poisoned by Sobraj who then nurtured them back to health in order to gain their obedience. As they recovered, Sobraj was visited by his previous victim Hakim's French girlfriend, Charmaine Caro, who had come to investigate her boyfriend's disappearance. Fearing exposure, Sobraj and Choudhury quickly hustled the couple out. Their bodies were found strangled and burned on 16 December 1975. Soon after, Karu was found drowned and wearing a similar styled swimsuit to that of Sobraj's earlier victim, Teresa Knowlton. Although the murders of both women were not connected by investigations at the time, they would later earn Sobraj the nickname the Bikini Killer. On 18 December, the day the bodies of Bintanju and Hemke were identified, Sobraj and Leclerc entered Nepal using the deceased pair's passports. Leclerc and Sobraj met in Nepal and, on 21-22 December, murdered Laurent Carrier, 26, from Canada, and Connie Bronzich, 29, from the United States. The two victims were incorrectly identified in some sources as Ludi Dupar and Annabella Tremont. Sobraj and Leclerc returned to Thailand, using their latest victims' passports before their bodies could be identified. Upon his return to Thailand, Sobraj discovered that his three French companions had started to suspect him of serial murder, having found documents belonging to the murder victims. Sobraj's former companions then fled to Paris after notifying local authorities. Sobraj's next destination was to either Varanasi or Calcutta, where he murdered Israeli scholar Avoni Jacob simply to obtain Jacob's passport. Sobraj used the passport to travel with Leclerc and Choudhury, first to Singapore, then to India, and, in March 1979, returning to Bangkok, despite knowing that the authorities there sought him. The clan was interrogated by Thai policemen in connection with the murders, but released because authorities feared that the negative publicity accompanying a murder trial would harm the country's tourist industry. Meanwhile, Dutch embassy diplomat Hermann Nippenberg was investigating the murders of Bintanju and Hemke. Nippenberg had some knowledge of, and had possibly even met, Sobraj, although the latter's true identity was still unknown to the diplomat, who continued gathering evidence. With the help of a neighbor of Sobraj, Nippenberg built a case against him. Nippenberg was eventually given police permission to search Sobraj's apartment a full month after the suspect had left the country. Nippenberg found evidence, including victims' documents and passports, as well as poisons and syringes. The trio's next stop was Malaysia, where Choudhury was sent to steal gems. Choudhury was observed delivering the gems to Sobraj. This was the last time he was ever seen, and neither Choudhury nor his remains were ever found.
It is believed that Sobraj murdered his former accomplice before leaving Malaysia to continue his and Leclerc's roles as gem salesman in Geneva. 16. A source later claimed to have cited Chowdhury in Germany, but the claim appeared unsubstantiated. The search for Chowdhury continues. Soon back in Asia, Sobraj started to build a new criminal family, starting with two lost Western women. Barbara Smith and Mary Ellen Iada, in Bombay. Sobraj's next victim was a Frenchman, Jean Luc Solomon, whose poisoning during a robbery, simply intended to incapacitate him, left him dead. In July 1976 in New Delhi, Sobraj, joined by his three woman criminal clan, tricked a tour group of French postgraduate students into accepting them as tour guides. Sobraj then drugged them by giving them poison pills, which he told them were anti-dysentery medicine. However, when the drugs took effect more quickly than Sobraj had anticipated, the students began to fall unconscious. Three of the students realized what Sobraj had done. They overpowered him and contacted the police, leading to his capture. During interrogation, Sobraj's accomplices, Barbara and Mary Ellen, quickly buckled and confessed. Sobraj was charged with the murder of Solomon, and all four were sent to Tihar prison, New Delhi while awaiting formal trial. Barbara and Mary Ellen attempted suicide in prison during the two years before their trial. Sobraj, however, had entered with precious gems concealed in his body and was experienced in bribing captors and living comfortably in jail. Sobraj turned his trial into a show hiring and firing lawyers at whim, bringing in his recently paroled brother Andre to assist, and eventually going on a hunger strike, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison instead of the expected death penalty. Leclerc was found guilty of drugging the French students, but was later paroled and returned to Canada when she developed her ovarian cancer. She was still claiming her innocence and was reportedly still loyal to Sobraj when she died at her home in April 1984. Sobraj's systematic bribery of prison guards at Tihar reached outrageous levels. He led a life of luxury inside the jail, with TV and gourmet food, having befriended both guards and prisoners. He gave interviews to Western authors and journalists, such as Oz Magazine's Richard Neville in the late 1970, and Alan Dawson in 1984. He freely talked about his murders, while never actually admitting to them and pretended that his actions were in retaliation against Western imperialism in Asia. When Sobraj's sentence was to end, the 20 years Tyrest warrant against him would still have been valid, thereby affecting his extradition and almost certain execution. So in March 1986, in his tenth year in prison, he threw a big party for his guards and fellow inmates, drugged them with sleeping pills and walked out of the jail. Inspector Madhuka's end of the Mumbai police apprehended Sobraj in Okokwero restaurant in Goa. His prison term was prolonged by 10 years, just as he had hoped. On 17 February 1997, 52 years old Sobraj was released with most warrants, evidence and even witnesses against him long lost. Without any country to extradite him to, Indian authorities let him return to France. Sobraj retired to a comfortable life in suburban Paris. He hired a publicity agent and charged large sums of money for interviews and photographs. He is said to have charged over US dollars 15 million for the rights to a movie based on his life. On 17 September 2003, Sobraj was seen in a street of Kathmandu by a journalist. The journalist quickly reported this to the Nepalese authorities who arrested him two days later in the casino of the Yak and Yeti Hotel. Sobraj's motives for returning to Nepal remain unknown. He was sentenced to life imprisonment by the Kathmandu District Court on 20 August 2004, for the murders of Bronzich and Carrier in 1975. Most of the photocopy evidence used against him in this case was from that gathered by Nippenberg, the Dutch embassy investigator, and Interpol. He appealed against the conviction, claiming that he was sentenced without trial. His lawyer also announced that Chantal, Sobraj's wife in France, 
was filing a case before the European Court of Human Rights against the French government, for refusing to provide him with any assistance. Sobradge's conviction was confirmed by the Payton Court of Appeals in 2005. In late 2007, news media reported that Sobradge's lawyer had appealed to the then French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, for intervention with Nepal. In 2008, Sobraj announced his engagement to an Apli woman Naita Biswas. On 7 July 2008, issuing a press release through his fiancée Naita, he claimed that he was never convicted of murder by any court and asked the media not to refer to him as a serial killer. It was claimed that he married his fiancée on 9 October 2008, in jail on Bada Das Hami, a Nepalese festival. On the following day, Nepalese jail authorities dismissed the claim of his marriage. They said that Naitu and her family had been allowed to conduct a tikka ceremony, along with the relatives of hundreds of other prisoners. They further claimed that it was not a wedding but part of the ongoing Dashain festival, when elders put the vermilion mark on the foreheads of those younger to them to signify their blessings. In July 2010, the Supreme Court of Nepal postponed the verdict on an appeal filed by Sobraj against a district court's verdict sentencing him to life imprisonment for the murder of American backpacker Connie Jo Bronzich in 1975. Sobraj had appealed against the district court's verdict in 2006, calling it unfair and accusing the judges of racism while handing out the sentence. On 30 July 2010 the Nepalese Supreme Court upheld the verdict issued by the District Court in Kathmandu of a life sentence for the murder of U.S. citizen Connie Jo Bronzich and another year plus a hour's 2000 fine for using a fake passport to travel. The seizure of all his properties was also ordered by the court. His mother-in-law, lawyer Shakuntala Thapa and his wife, Nai to express dissatisfaction with the verdict and Thapa claimed that Saab Raj had been, denied, justice and, judiciary is corrupt. They were charged and sent to judicial custody, for contempt of court because of these remarks. Saab Raj currently has another case pending against him in the Bakdapur District Court for the murder of Canadian tourist Laurent Carrier. As of 18 September 2014, Sobraj was convicted in Nepal of another murder. Kindly don't forget to like and subscribe our channel for more thrilling stories from around the world. Thank you for watching this video.